well, sometimes it's a little extra loud. Don't see if I can turn it down just a little bit. See if I can move it down. y'all hear okay if you can hear good enough that's what counts uh you will go ahead and open your bibles now to Acts 17 we're going to begin at verse 5 Acts 17 verse 5 and uh let me go ahead and start in verse 4 because it is it just me today <laughs> it's got to be me there's something wrong with me today uh I don't know if it's a connection somewhere to get the video part fixed and then something else breaks. So uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, something is not communicating well. And if it gets too bad, I'll turn the microphone off and then you'll see. Is this worse than... Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me now?
get to the synagogue, some were persuaded. What does that tell you about um, Paul's message? How well does it play some places? Very good. Sometimes people listen. Sometimes people <laughs> do not. Uh, I know every preacher that I guess I've ever met wishes they could speak and everybody would listen. And everybody would respond. <clears throat> but is that realistic? No. No, it's not realistic because it wasn't realistic in the first century. Not everybody listened to Jesus. Not everybody listened to Paul. And for that reason, we realize that not everyone is going to respond the way they ought to. Because some people have prejudices. <coughs> some people have their minds already made up. Well, it says here, though, that there was a great multitude of the devout Greeks. And we talked about that last week. The God-fearers, those Greeks who had embraced the God of the Bible. And it says, not a few of the prominent women. Now, when you get to verse 5, it says, but the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Now, there's several things in verse 5 that I think needs to be uh, observed. Who are the ones who are creating the havoc here? The Jews. They're the Jews. They're the ones who were not persuaded. Some were persuaded, others were not. Paul goes into the synagogue, and there's some people saying, that makes sense. We're listening to you. Others said, no, we don't like what you're saying. And it says, they became envious. Who are they envious of? Oh, <laughs> the Greeks. The Greeks. Uh, the Jews becoming envious of these Greeks. You can see this illustrated in Romans chapter 11 when he talks about the Jews and then the Gentiles accepting the gospel and becoming Christians and how that brought about a jealousy among the Jewish people and then it then brought about them coming back and he says in Romans 11 verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. In other words, it was God's plan to do it this way. But notice what they do. They took some of the evil men from the marketplace. That's a thought all on its own. Marketplace. What, are, what is the marketplace? Okay, that's the, where they buy and sell. It's Walmart. It's where you can buy anything you need to buy. It's where people would gather together. Would you suppose there are any loafers at the marketplace? Uh, why are they loafers? They don't want to work. In other words, they're, uh, they're there. And somebody says, hey, we got something we want to do. All right, what you want us to do? Now, here he says they're evil men. What does that tell you about them? <laughs> they're thugs. There are people just out here looking for whatever they can get out of it. So they get these evil men and they are gathering a mob. What does that mean? A mob. Okay, they're ready to target somebody. They're creating a, some sort of uprising. Have we had some of that in our country in the past few years? Then in some of the cities that people get together and throw bricks, set public buildings on fire, set cars and buses on fire. What kind of people would you call those people? Okay. They're rioters. They're evil men. When you take something that doesn't belong to you and you destroy it, are you good or evil? You're evil. 
Now, let's call what it is. Uh, right is right and wrong is wrong. And for me to take and destroy your business, to destroy your home, to destroy your life, that's evil. Now, they did that, and they set all the city in an uproar. Uh, this is a significant city they've got all tore up now. And it says they attacked the house of Jason. Now, why do you suppose they're after Jason? Well, turn with me to Romans 16 and verse 21 for just a second. Romans 16 and verse 21. Because as Paul writes this letter to the Romans, he includes a number of his workers, fellow workers. He said in verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen. What would that indicate? If they're countrymen. They're all Jews. Now, if Paul was successful persuading some of the Jews of the synagogue to be obedient to the faith, and he says in Romans 16, verse 21, one of my countrymen, salute you, his name's Jason. It's likely this is the same Jason. And so you can see why they would go after Jason. Now, we're going to learn from verse 6 why they did that. He said, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. Literally, the word harbored means they brought him under his roof. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. Now, um, I want to go back to verse 6 for just a second here when he says, these who have turned the world upside down. What does that tell you about the accusation leveled against Paul and Timothy and Silas and Luke? Well, Luke's not with them. Luke's in Philippi. That's a good observation. They're trying to turn it right side up. It's upset the status quo. Chaos. But let me notice the word, these who have turned the world upside down. Is there a record of Paul going everywhere and chaos and conflict following him? Everywhere he went. So what happens is if he goes into the city, he teaches the truth. What does teaching the truth do to the status quo of morality and religious practice? It turns it upside down because it's saying this is what God says to do and this is what you're doing and you've got to quit doing what you're doing and do what God says to do. And those people who don't want to change get mad. I believe sometimes the Lord's church has been a little bit too passive. Sometimes we're not vocal enough to stir up some trouble. Now, I don't believe stirring up trouble for the wrong way, but I think we ought to teach the truth to the point that people know the difference between right and wrong. To make it clear, you know, are we turning the world upside down or are we polishing the world? You know, that's a question I think needs to be asked. And so they come and they're, uh, notice they take Jason and it says they are saying they're acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. Has that ever been leveled before? You remember John chapter 18 when Pilate brings in Jesus and he says, are you a king? What's the response to that answer? John 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, 
Therefore, my kingdom is not from here. Jesus is saying, we're not here to fight against the Roman Empire. We're not here to fight against the Jewish nation. But what he's trying to say is this is who we are. We're a, Jesus is a king, but they're taking and twisting, and I think it's significant here, who is saying this? The Jews. But uh, did the Jews really accept Caesar as king? What were they looking for in a Messiah? Somebody who would be a deliverer king who would deliver them from the bondage of the Romans. So uh, in all of this here, they're trying to uh, make some accusation. Well, well, they would, but they're not going to admit that. But you see, you remember if you go back when they crucified Jesus, it was the same thing. You know, they said, you know, we have no king but Caesar. And they didn't really believe that. But that's, you know, all you have to do is look at the first century and see the way the Jews acted. What brought on the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 was their rebellion against the Roman government. And you go to the latter end of the first century and the Bar Kokhova uh, revolt, you know, when Masada was destroyed, that, you know, it's all about the revolt against the Roman rule. And so uh, these people here are responding. Now, verse 8 says, And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. Now, why would you be troubled if you were a city leader, if you heard something like that? Okay, what? Do you remember back in John 11 and uh, as you have Caiaphas being a prophet, he says that the Romans will come away and take away our na play, this place and our nation. Uh, they really believed that if you insult, you know, today, can we say something about our president or our governor or whatever and get away with it? Now, I'm talking about if we complain, we gripe, we say, I don't like this one, I don't like that one. Can you do that and not worry about some civil authority coming and locking you up? Could they do that in first century Rome? No. And also, if there was a riot in your city, were you responsible as a city leader for keeping that riot under control? Yes, if Rome had to step in, it was not going to be pretty. And so they are concerned when the rulers hear these things. Number one, they're saying there's another king, Jesus. And number two, there's a mob that's got a riot going on. And are there some people always willing to fan a flame to get what they want? Yes, and that's what they're doing here. Verse 9, so when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. What is security? Money? Uh, we got them today. They're called bail bondsmen. But what are they there for? Get you out of jail. But what do they do? They require something to say, I'm going to answer for these charges. I'll be here. And if you don't show up, they come after you. Not only then are the law after you, but who else is after you? Dog the bounty hunter. <laughs> You've got people who are out looking for you, and they'll pursue you. They'll find you wherever you want to hide. Well, what is taking place here is they've taken security from Jason, but also from the rest. We want you to answer for this, and uh, I'm thinking perhaps to say, we're going to do this, and you better not get in trouble in the meanwhile. Because if you get in trouble in the meanwhile, what's going to happen? You're going to su surrender your security, your bail. You're going to have to let it go. Well, verse 10 says, Then the brethren 
immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, it's interesting here. Very first thing, it says, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away. First of all, why are they getting Paul and Silas out of town? They, they know what's going on here. They can see the handwriting on the wall. And the brethren said, you know, it's important, it's valuable for you to go on. Uh, we'll take it from here. But you need to go on, Paul and Silas. And so it says they went away by night. Why did they go by night? Not be seen. That's always, when you see by night, that's the under the cover of darkness. But then it says they went to Berea. And that's interesting because you're going to go south, southwest, and uh, 45 miles. And that's going to be important because we'll start reading about what takes place. Is a 45-mile trip a pretty good little trip? You know, like going to Murfreesboro, uh, Cookville, you're talking about, and if you had to walk that or ride on an animal, how long would it take you? A couple days, you know. Uh, we won't, won't get these guys out of here. So they're sending them to Berea, which actually is on the Ignatian Way. It's, it's on the trip that they're going to make. Now, if you go to 1 Thessalonians 2.18, and I've been trying to resist going to 1 and 2 Thessalonians, but Paul said that he wanted to return. He said, but Satan hindered us. Now, likely here is uh, Satan is involved in all this, trying to stop Paul from preaching. And he'd rather be able to do that and to discourage them. And so... Um, that they were worried here about what might take place. So they go and they arrive, and where do they go? Synagogue of the Jews. And uh, what has Paul met as he's gone to each of these synagogues? Some success, but generally the unbelieving Jews are the ones who then become the rabble-rousers. And uh, so in this case, what you have is Paul and Silas arriving, and they go to the synagogue of the Jews. But verse 11, perhaps one of the most noted verses in chapter 17, these were more fair-minded, or these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily, to find out whether these things were so. Now, first thing I want to notice is this word here, fair-minded. Uh, Eugene's going to appreciate this word. Because the word for fair-minded or noble is the word E-U-G-E-N-E-S. That's, that's the Greek word. And it means somebody of noble birth. So I told you you'd appreciate that. Of noble birth. But it was also a synonym of a person who was open-minded, willing to listen. Which that's good for you too, isn't it? Somebody who's, who is willing to listen and evaluate what you're saying. You're not saying somebody is credulous, who will believe just anything you tell them. But they're not closed-minded where they won't listen to anything you have to say. Now, who are these that he's referring to? That's important. Where has he just been in verse 10? He's in the synagogue. Now, he's saying these, these Jews, these Jews in this synagogue that's here at Berea, they're more open, fair-minded, noble people than those in Thessalonica. Well, what makes them that? In that they receive the word with all readiness. Now, uh, readiness means they're willing to listen. And, uh, you know, I've been places where I've gone and held meetings or done uh, summer series, and I get up in the pulpit and I look and everybody's, I tell you, it's hard to preach and teach when everybody's just sort of not paying attention. But then I've been to some places 
and uh, you are just really amazed. Everybody is just like they're listening to everything you have to say. That you can tell they're evaluating it. Uh, Brother Chris Whitaker used to preach at Franklin Road in Murfreesboro, and I spoke there two or three times, and I remember the first time I went there, every verse I started quoting, I could look out and the people were mouthing the words. And I'm like, wow, that's impressive. They knew what I was going to say before I said it. And uh, they're listening very carefully because they're involved in what you're teaching, what you're uh, preaching. And here he says, they receive the word with all readiness. But now there's something else. They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. Do you suppose it was a challenge if you were reared a Jew in the first century? And here comes somebody and tells you that there is a Messiah has come? Were they looking for the Messiah? Yes. Well, now here somebody comes and said, here's who he is. He's Jesus of Nazareth. Well, as you speak and you teach about Jesus of Nazareth, well, is this really the Messiah or not? How do you know? Well, I don't think they were looking for Isaiah 53, but Isaiah 53 was there. Because when you talk about a suffering servant, did their minds picture their Messiah as going to be a suffering servant, or did they picture him as being a warrior? A warrior. I have no doubt that he introduced the idea of a suffering servant. Say, this Jesus who was crucified, rose again, victorious over the tomb. They wanted a king just like their forefathers did when they wanted Saul, David, and Solomon. That's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for a religious king. They were looking for a warrior king. But if you... Go back and you say, okay, well, let's look at the prophecies. Let's look at Psalms 110. Let's look at Isaiah 53. Let's look at Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Let's, let's look at all these prophecies. And one by one by one by one, Jesus fulfills every one of them. And they say, yeah, that's what the scriptures say. They search the scriptures daily to find out, which seems to indicate that Paul's preaching must have been what? daily. He's going through a process of teaching the message to them, and it says to find out whether these things were so. Uh, therefore, now in contrast to what happened at uh, Thessalonica here in Berea, therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Now there's three categories of people here. Therefore, many of them. Who's them? The Jews in the synagogue. There's the predominant conversion of them here, but there's also not a few of the Greeks. There's a number of Greek people who are listening, and they're obeying the gospel as well. And then he talks about some prominent women as well as men. Uh, people of influence. Uh, sometimes we want to emphasize that Everybody is important, and we want to then somehow talk down people of prominence. Is there anything wrong with converting somebody who is prominent? Nothing wrong with converting anybody. But can prominent people sometimes be in a position to make it better for the church? They have greater influence. They have an outreach of people. And they may have funds available to see that the gospel goes in other places. I think about Lydia. Was Lydia a woman perhaps of considerable means to be able to help the preaching of the gospel go into all the world? I have no doubt about that. So uh, he's talking about those who were converted here in verse 12. And uh, then verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowd. I find it interesting. The Jews in Berea are not the problem. 
Who's the problem? The ones from Thessalonica. How far away did I tell you they were? 45 miles away. How many of you would drive to Murfreesboro or Cookville to try to stand up against somebody that you didn't agree with? I think it's important to realize these people were stirred up. They were mad. They were angry. But that's the point I was going to make, is that Paul is now facing the same payback, if you will, of what he did because he was willing to go all the way to Damascus from Jerusalem in order to try to persecute people there. And so... Uh, he is himself getting some payback here of all this. And so they've stirred up the crowds, and they've created a conflict here now. Well, let's go to verse 14. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. Now, what's that second word that you see there that's significant? Immediately. Do the brethren realize the significance of Paul's remaining free in order to preach? He's planted the seed, and now uh, it's valuable for Paul to go on and to preach somewhere else. So they sent Paul away to go to the sea, which indicates he's probably going to go in a further direction. And in fact, he's actually going to go on to Athens. But uh, it says both Silas and and Timothy remained there. And uh, one of the things I think is invaluable for us is that if you're reading the epistles along with this, you, you learn a little more information. Luke at this point is just trying to record to us, here's Paul comes, he preaches, he has success. There's persecution comes, and so he goes to the next place. He goes to the next place. Well, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, you know that they did come to Paul, but he sent them back to Macedonia, which Macedonia would have included both Philippi and Thessalonica. And so evidently, uh, they came to Paul. It's what he said. They remained there, but they came to Paul, and Paul sent them back. And then Paul went to Corinth, and Silas and Timothy come to meet Paul while he's in Corinth. And that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, as well as Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you're up here at Thessalonica. You go over to Berea, go a little bit south, go west. I guess I need to turn around. And so, you, But you go, then you go to the sea like you're going to go, and he's going to leave Paul and, or Silas and Timothy there, and he's going to head to Athens. But what he's going to do, Paul's going to send them back. They need you there there at Berea. So uh, uh, all of this is taking place as we read this section, and uh, Paul is now going to be left in Athens. Let's go to chapter, to verse 15 of chapter 17 now. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now notice it says those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens. Is there a group of people traveling with Paul? Yes. They brought him to Athens. And what is his concern when he gets to Athens? Okay. Four idols. What's in this verse here? Yeah, I want them to come to us with all speed. What does that mean to say with all speed? Hurry up. You know, I don't want you to stop here, stop there. I want you to come immediately. Uh, why do you suppose Paul is wanting Silas and Timothy to come so quickly? Perhaps concern for their safety? How many of you have ever been in a foreign place by yourself? And in a foreign place that's been hostile to you? 
I mean, if you were making a journey, say, for instance, around the world, and you had to stop in a predominantly Muslim country, would you feel comfortable? Why not? A lot of people may would just look at us as an enemy. And uh, Paul, yeah. well, I think there, there's a sense in which being left alone was a real concern to Paul. He didn't want to be left alone. The book of Ecclesiastes. So here we have Paul telling them to come with all speed and they departed, and I think that's they as those who conducted Paul. So Paul's here left alone. Let's go ahead and read verse 16. Now, while Paul waited in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. And uh, let me ask you a question. How many idols were there in Athens? One of the historians said that there were more idols in Athens than there were people. More idols than there were people. Yeah, everyone you can name, and then when they run out of names of all of them, you remember which they had another one. Yeah, the unknown God, the one we don't know about. We don't want to skip him. We don't want to forget him, so... The unknown God will we'll have an altar to him so that we'll make sure we got all of our bases covered. So Paul's spirit was provoked within him. What does that mean? Troubled? He's looking around and he is discouraged and disgusted. Why would he be so discouraged and disgusted? Yeah. Uh, no one there really knows who the true God is. If I go to someone's house in the south here, do you suppose that most of the people will know who I'm talking about when I talk about the God of the Bible and when I call out a book of the Bible as a, a reference? Are there places in the world that you can go and you can say, let's go to 1 Corinthians? And they would say, the what, what? What's that? And uh, do, are there places in the world where the Bible is not very well known? Yes. And uh, sometimes that's what I, I keep reading people to say that our preaching and our teaching needs to step back and be a little more fundamental because there are people who may be listening who has no background about what is in the Bible and we need to be able to reach them and so for that reason here, his spirit is turned, and therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. Now, that's probably going to be as far as I'll get today. But notice the groups of people. So he goes to the synagogues, and he reasons with them there. And you remember I told you a couple of weeks ago what the word reasoned comes from the word dialogami, which we get our English word dialogue. What does that mean if you have a dialogue with somebody? It's a discussion. In other words, one side speaks, another side speaks. Some, somebody has a question, somebody has an answer. Uh, there's a discussion. I like that kind of teaching because when I'm up preaching, I don't know what everybody's thinking. I don't know if they're understanding or not. I'm trying to be as simple and as basic as possible, but are, is it possible to be misunderstood? Absolutely it is. But when you are talking, someone may say, but I don't understand what you're saying here. Are you suggesting? Are you saying this? Are you saying that? Oh, let me clarify that. Let me go to another passage of Scripture. So he is reasoning with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers. That's those Gentiles, those Greeks, 
who've come into the synagogue, who've embraced the God of the Bible. So don't think that Athens was 100% pagan, but it is predominantly pagan. And that's the important part to realize. It's predominantly pagan. And then it says, and in the marketplace daily. Now, that's where I want to stop here just a second. The marketplace daily. What was Paul doing as he was waiting on Timothy and Silas? Preaching and teaching in the synagogue, but if you want a crowd of people, where do you go? You go to the marketplace. And that's where you've got people, and I will tell you that it was acceptable. Uh, if I went to Walmart and I got me a little megaphone and I started preaching in the corners of the aisles, what do you think would happen after a little while? They'd throw you out. But you see, the marketplace didn't belong to one person. It was a place of public gathering. And later on, we're going to study about next Sunday about what they're going to call Paul. They're going to call him a babbler or a seed picker. And what that means is there were people who were listening to what this guy said over here. They were listening to what this guy said over here. And just like a bird would go pick a little seed here, pick a little seed here, pick a little seed there, and then just bring them all back and say, okay, now I'm, I'm just giving you a little bit of air. They thought that Paul was just somebody out there just babbling because he was teaching this in the marketplace. Uh, have you ever been anywhere where somebody preached on the street corner? Oh, I know. That's a, uh, I've, I remember going to New Orleans my first and only time, and if the Lord will help me, my last time. <laughs> uh, but down there on Canal Street, there was a guy who was standing on the street corner with a megaphone, and he was preaching. It was yesterday at Farmer's Market, okay? Uh, so, you know, if you're... If you've got somebody who's standing up and they're preaching, people can listen. And it says that those who happen to be there, you're just passing by. You're hearing what he's got to say. Is it valuable for us to try to go where people are? Let me ask you the question. Where are people today? They're on Facebook. You're on YouTube, and uh, that's the reason why somebody says, well, why, you know, I'm not on Facebook, or I'm not on YouTube, or I'm not on this. That's where people are, and if that's where they are, that's where you got to go, isn't it? That's not the only place you're going to go, but that's one place you're going to go because you've got to reach people out there who just happen to be there, and you may not have any other opportunity to reach those people than by going at this means. Now, does that mean people are going to listen and they're going to do it? Not necessarily, but you at least put the gospel out there. Lord willing, we're going to pick up with verse 18 next week.